It's a joy to be with you again today. I bid you Godspeed in this great work that you're engaged in. There's nothing more wonderful than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing more challenging. And that because you're challenged in your own spirituality on a regular basis. The more you study the Bible, the more you realize you, you want to know more. And you need to be better for His glory. It's challenging because you're working with people. And people have clay feet. Just as you. And all your life you're going to know disappointment as a gospel preacher. But all of your life you're going to be riding in the clouds. Because this is a great way to live and to serve God. Those of us that are preachers, can you amen that? Amen. It's just wonderful. You're going to have highs, you're going to have lows. Sometimes the lows are going to be protracted. Sometimes the lows are going to blind you to the highs. But sometimes the highs are going to blind you to the lows. And that's just a part of this work. But you know what? If you were an engineer, you would find the very same thing. That's just life. But the joy of preaching is you have the greatest of all co-workers at your side. And who would that be? But God the Father and Jesus Christ and God the Holy Spirit. What a staff to work with. So I bid you God's speed in all that you strive to do in your studies here when you graduate and press on. We're studying 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. Let's do the math. Let's see. 1st John chapter 1, 10 verses. Chapter 2, 29 verses. That's 39. Chapter 3, 24 verses, that's 63. Chapter 4, 21 verses, that's 84. And then chapter 5 has 21 verses, that's 105 verses. <coughs> 105 verses yesterday. Today... We're going to look at 2 John and 3 John. One has 13 verses and one has 14. 27 verses. Whew. I don't know about you, but I'm happy about today. We're going to cover about 25% of the material in mass that we covered yesterday. So we're going to be able to go in stride today. Yesterday, it was... Shirt tail sticking straight out all day long. We were going that fast. And I don't feel like we accomplished much as far as being able to look in detail at the book. But we did it that way for a reason. Because 1 John more or less sets the foundation for 2 John and 3 John. In that 1 John sets the foundation of fellowship with God. 2 John and 3 John applies that foundation and teaches us with whom we are to fellowship today based upon our fellowship with God. So all these books are networked together with the same silver thread and that is the concept of biblical fellowship. Let's remind ourselves, of looking at the screen, where we were yesterday in the book of 1 John. In laying the foundation, dealing with the concept of fellowship itself. Of course, the book of 1 John was written, as we think, by John the Apostle of Jesus, the best friend of our Lord. And it was written to faithful Christians who had come to know forgiveness, liberty from their past sins. Who had come to know in an intimate fashion as a father and son relationship, God the Father. Who had come to know in an intimate fashion Jesus Christ as an elder brother who had come to know the, uh, uh, the joy of conquering and overcoming Satan and Satan's involvement and power over their past lives. Faithful Christians. The book of 1 John was written by Jesus Christ to faithful Christians and it has a specific purpose. 
It was written so that faithful Christians can know the joy of fellowship with God. And know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, pleading our case when as faithful Christians we sin and we do. And it was written to, know, to help us to know that we are, as a result of our fellowship with God, maintained by the mediation of Jesus, in a present state of salvation. We are in a state of salvation. We're saved. The book of 1 John was written so that we can have the joy of knowing that because of the work of Jesus, we are and remain in a saved condition as long as we walk in the light as God is in the light. Wow! Wow! What a wonderful message. Fellowship with God in a saved condition. 1 John. The first two chapters deal with our fellowship with God. The second two chapters deal with our being members of God's family, the family of God. The last chapter deals with our faith in God, which supports our fellowship as members of His family. Now today we're going to look at the next two books found in our New Testament in succession, 2 John and 3 John. This morning, 2 John. This afternoon after lunch, 3 John. And here's the course that we will pursue for this morning and this afternoon. First of all, we'll look at the book. We'll look at the book briefly. Watch it unfold. And then we are going to step away from the book itself and deal with the emphasis of the book and apply it to our lives in reference to those with whom we should not or with whom we should fellowship. Okay? Second John. As we did with 1 John... Let's ask three introductory questions. Who, whom, why? Who wrote the book? To whom was the book written? And why was it written? As far as the first question, introductory question goes, who wrote the book, we would suggest that the author of 2 John is the same author of 1 John. And we make that suggestion for two basic reasons. First of all, more than half of the material in the book of 2 John is found in 1 John. Second, similar terminology is found in 2 John as in 1 John. As we read these 13 verses in a minute, Pay particular attention to these words, children. Do you remember in 1 John, I write these things to you little children, and he said that over and over and over again. Look for the word children in the book of 2 John. Look for the word beginning. Do you remember how 1 John started? Referencing the one who was in the beginning? And how that suggested to us that the author of 1 John was probably the author of the Gospel of John, the best friend of Jesus, his apostle, who began his Gospel in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him was not anything made that hath been made, and the Word was light, life of man. So look for the word beginning as we read 2 John, as it was in 1 John. Look for the word commandment. Do you remember the five times in the book of 1 John we find the phraseology, keep His commandments? And 1 John suggests to us that we keep His commandments because it's what we want to do. Because we're walking in the light with Him. Because we have fellowship with Him. It's what we want to do. It's what we do. Because of who we are and whose we are. 
Look for the word commandment as we read 2 John. <coughs> Look for the word love as we read the book of 2 John. You can't read 1 John, especially chapters 3 and 4, unless you find the word repeatedly. When you read 2 John, look for the word deceivers or deceiver. Do you remember in 1 John how reference was made to both schools of Gnosticism? That is the incipient form of Gnosticism. The Serinthian Gnostics who denied the, the deity of Jesus. And they were called deceivers. They were called liars. And the Docetic Gnostics who denied the humanity of Jesus and how they also were called liars, deceivers. Look for the word deceiver in the book of 2 John. Children, beginning, commandment, love, deceivers. Look for the word antichrist in the book of 2 John. And you remember that both the Serinthian Gnostics in 1 John chapter 2 and the Docetic Gnostics in 1 John chapter 4, these... Gnostics in incipient form were both called opposite to, against, Antichrist. Look for the word Antichrist in the book of 2 John as we read it here in a few minutes. We would suggest that the author of 2 John is the best friend of Jesus, one of his apostles, John, brother of James, son of Zebedee, member of Jesus' inner circle. To whom was it written? That's a hard one. What's the introductory verses? Verses 1 and 2, the elder. That doesn't mean that the author of this book was a Mormon. You ever had a Mormon knock on your door? Do they have a badge? Does the badge have their name? Does the badge have a title? And what do they call themselves? I mean, they can't even grow a beard, but they call themselves the elder. They don't have any gray hair, and yet they call themselves the elder. This book begins by saying the elder, which would suggest probably if indeed this was the, uh, the apostle of Jesus and best friend of Jesus, John, that is writing this later on in his life. He's the older one, the elder. To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. This book was written by an older John the Apostle, and it was written to the elect lady and her children. Now there are two possibilities as to who the elect lady and the children might be. Possibility number one, a sister in Jesus that was precious and special to John the Apostle. If that be the case, her children would be her offspring. <coughs> we all have special brothers and sisters in our lives. Friends outside of our family. Barbara Bettner's in my life. Barbara is not my wife. My wife is Diane. She's been my wife of 43 years. But one special lady in my life is a lady named Barbara Bettner. I met Barbara when I moved to Nashville, Tennessee 20 years ago. She was a member of the Creve Hall Church of Christ. She's a dear friend of Tom Holland, another dear friend of mine. And philosophically, Barbara, and Diane, and I are just kind of walk in lockstep. Barbara's much older than I. 
though full of life and joy. She's asked me to preach her funeral, and, and Tom as well. When that time comes, Lord willing, many years yet. Barbara's a special lady. When my son died, Barbara was a dear friend also to my mentor and his wife, both deceased now, William Woodson and Jean. So our lives kind of intermingled in a multitude of ways. When my son was killed, on Wednesday, Barbara called me. He died on Tuesday. She called me on Wednesday. She said, Hun, can I do anything for you? I said, Barbara, could you call Brother Woodson? I said, um, could you ask him to come see me? So she called. That was on Wednesday. On Friday, there's a knock at my back door. And there's my mentor, suitcase in hand. He came in, put a suitcase in the room. We came back to the den. We sat down. Everybody else dispersed. I said, Brother Woodson, I don't have a daddy anymore. Would you just talk with me? Just visit? And there's some very, very, very dark days. William Woodson and his sweet wife, Jean, were there. We get a telephone call. If you knew William and Jean, I don't call him William, I call him Brother Woodson. If you knew Brother Woodson and Jean, you knew which of the two was the vocal. It was Jean. She was a sweet sister in Jesus to me. Barbara Bettner put us together on that occasion. He, she called for me. And she's a sweet sister. Maybe John the Apostle had a Barbara Bettner in his life. Maybe John the Apostle had a Jean Woodson in his life. And unnamed, this book is written to her and to her children. That's a possibility. Possibility number two. Elect lady is a cryptogram for the church. The church is metaphorically described as a lady. And if that be the case, her children will be her converts. Some specific congregation that was close to the Apostle John. Or just a grouping of congregations, or perhaps Christians in general, and those who are brought to Jesus by these particular Christians, congregations, congregation that he had in mind. We don't know. We don't know, nor will we ever know. Now, of the two possibilities, I lean more personally toward the latter of the two. It's not uncommon for the Holy Spirit to reference the church as a lady. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, you'll remember that the church is described as the bride of Christ. And the husband-wife relationship is in detail used to illustrate the Christ-church relationship. Ephesians 5, 23 through 33. So it's not uncommon to reference the church as a lady... But if you look at the last verse of this book, it says, The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So if this is a particular individual, then John is saying, Now, your nieces and nephews greet you as well. And that, I think, weakens the idea of this being a specific sister. But rather he's writing to a congregation, a group of congregations, Christians in general, the church, and he's saying to the church and to those who are converts of the church, by the way, your sister congregation, congregations salute you as well. I think verse 13 might help me lean more toward the idea that the elect lady is a reference to a congregation as well as verse 13 another congregation 
Also, I think strengthening the idea that this is written to a congregation or to the church, a particular congregation of the church or the church at large. You have that modifier elect, the elect lady, and then the children of your elect sister. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say, You are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Verse 10, You who were no people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. The elect are those who are having received mercy ones. The forgiven. You want the identity of the church? There it is, folks. The church consists of those who have received the forgiveness of God. Simple, pure, can't make it any more elementary than that. Members of the church are those, those who belong to God are those those who are in fellowship with God are those who have received the, first, the mercy, the forgiveness of God. And so if you want to know if you're a member of the Lord's church, then go through the book, the New Testament, and learn what to do to receive God's forgiveness. Isn't that simple? Go through the New Testament and learn what to do to receive God's mercy. Isn't that simple? Ask yourself, have I done what God says I need to do to receive His mercy, His forgiveness? I'm a member of His church. Have you gone through the New Testament? Have you done what God says do to receive His mercy, His forgiveness? You're a member of God's called out ones. It's that simple. So here's a book written probably by the Lord's best friend, member of His inner circle, John the Apostle, the Apostle whom Jesus loved, written either to a special sister, Christian in his life and her children, or probably to a congregation or a grouping of congregations and those they have brought to Jesus, Christians. Why was it written? Question number three. We look for the key verses and the key word or words in the book to answer that question. Putting a finger on the pulse of 2 John, the key verses to me would be verses 9 through 11. <coughs> Excuse me. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. More on that when we look at the book itself, verse by verse. But capturing the sentiment of those three verses. The concept of 2 John is, now, do not receive, do not extend your fellowship to people like this. So the fellowship to which we gave our attention yesterday in 1 John chapters 1 to 5, is something that we are to withhold according to the emphasis of 2 John. Now there are several words that we could employ as the key word of 2 John. We would simply select the word doctrine because it is the word that is embedded in these three verses of, of interest in verses 9 through 11. In fact, doctrine is found three times in these three verses, an average of once a verse. 
Other verses that we could view as synonymous in thought to doctrine would be the word truth. We saw it in the introductory verses, verses 1 to 3. To the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, peace will be with you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of the, Fa- and of the Father. In truth and love. Four times. Verse 4 goes on. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. Five times. A synonym for the doctrine. Another synonym that we could emphasize in 2 John would be the word commandment. It's found in verse 4, receive the commandment. It's found in verse 5, I I haven't written a new commandment. It's found twice in verse 6, this is the love that we walk according to His commandments. And this is the commandment. Now put them together. You have a body of information called the truth. Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, King James Version. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Handling aright the word of truth. The word of truth. So truth is a word that is used by the Holy Spirit to capsule the idea of God's revelation. The truth. Commandment. God's revelation involves law. Back 15 years ago, Brother James, Brother David, Brother Jody, Brother Stephen, you all remember the New hermeneutic, which wasn't new at all. And it was carrying the idea, now the New Testament or the Bible, it's not a constitution. Remember that? It's a love letter. It's not a law, it's a love letter. My response to that was, excuse me, it's neither one of those. It's a book of redemption. From a heart of love that entails law. And so it's called the law of faith in Romans 4. It's called the law of the Spirit in Romans 8. It's called the law of Christ in Galatians 5. It's called the law of liberty in James 1. Commandment. I have a dear friend, former deacon in the Lord's church. Commandment is not one of his favorite words. He really, really struggles with the grace works combination. I love him and he loves me. He doesn't agree with me and I don't agree with him. He's helping me to grow. And I'm helping him to grow. He struggles with the idea of obeying a law. Commandments. I don't know what in the world he does with these verses that involves the word commandments. Here is a body of information called the truth, God's revelation. And God's revelation involves a law with commandments that are to be obeyed. And this revelation that involves a law, commandments that are to be obeyed, also encapsulates a teaching about Jesus Christ. The Didache, the teaching. In our passage, New King James translation, the doctrine. Yes.
so for some we do not pray and for some we do. Oh, oh, yes, being prayed up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hear, two, I hear two questions. Why were we that way? Number two, are we still that way or are we to the other extreme? Okay, let me, let me respond to both of those. I, like you, you're just, you're just a, you're a lot older than I am. We were raised in the same environment. And so uh, I will give you my take. I cannot tell you why those who were older than we emphasized things that they did the way they did. I wasn't in their heart. I'm going to, I'm going to put a finger on the pulse of what I experienced. I'm not talking about my home. I'm just talking about things in general. And give you my take. He worked really hard not to be that way. Right. Yes. Right. Right. I think we've... Here's, here's my take on this. First of all, uh, I believe that it, it was a cultural thing. Let me, I put it this way. I use the wars we've experienced to illustrate the cultural shift that has been experienced. There was World War II when the sergeant said, jump in that foxhole full of grenades. Yes, sir. And then they went and died. Then there was Vietnam. Jump in that foxhole full of grenades. Not on your life. That's the 1960s. You remember them? Peace, brother. Peace, brother. You're not going to say peace, brother. <laughs> he is hard-nosed, isn't he? <laughs> hey, Jody, peace, brother. <laughs> okay. And then you have Desert Storm. Jumping that foxhole full of grenades. Why? Explain to me why. Yes, sir. And so we've seen a cultural shift. Now, when we were children, adults were coming out of a culture that was fostered by that mindset of World War II. And authority was, yes, sir. And I think that tainted, honestly. I think that influenced emphases. And we became a yes sir to authority. And that's, not a, that's not all bad. Second, I believe that in culture, the 1960s began to visibly and forcibly rebel against that. And it was a knee-jerk reaction to this paradigm shift in culture where if it's tradition, it's to be canned, if not canned, suspicioned. We called it back in the 60s, anti-what? Establishment. 
And so if it's a, the establishment, we're against it. And a knee-jerk reaction to that was we embed ourselves with our authority and we become more rigid. Coming out of that anti-establishment, a few years transpire and all of us who were surrounded by hippies, not hippies, Jody still looks like one, uh, all those of us that were surrounded by hippies that were crying anti-establishment, peace brother, make love, not war, they ceased being teenagers and they, the, the hippies became yuppies. And they began to make a lot of money. And they began to be put into positions of responsibility. And they began to step into our pulpits. And they began to step into our elderships. And today, with the new hermeneutic, what were we hearing? If it's tradition, it needs to be revisited. And that's nothing more than these guys that were in the 60s saying anti-establishment now in the 80s and 90s saying the same thing. So I think we were that way because it was a knee-jerk reaction to a cultural paradigm shift and our becoming Im just, just embedded and entrenched in our yes sir to authority and no you won't. Are we that way today? No. I, I, I'm giving you my personal assessment. I don't think we're as much that way today. For a few reasons. One, some who were that way were mistreated by others who were that way. And they began to see the light. We don't need to be like that. They got a taste of their own medicine. And it pushed them away from the far right to a more centrist posture. Am I making sense? Second, there have been some that have been crying balance forever. And thanks be unto God, that message is being heard. And we are becoming more centrist as a people. Third, we realize the extreme right isn't the answer. But we know the extreme left isn't either. And we need to strive to stand on the fulcrum of Jesus Christ and be balanced. Now that's where I think we are today, striving to be balanced. Now if you're like I am, David, that's a day-to-day -day challenge. As far as how I respond to life and as far as my, my concepts as I constantly try to grow and be more like Jesus, I find, I find it a struggle not to lean one direction or the other. Don't you? Wonderful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. You're saying you like the words of man more than you'd like the words of the Lord? <laughs> and that's balance? <laughs> we know that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that so? There, case in point, I visited with a young preacher just recently who was looking for a place to preach. And he went to a congregation and tried out, as they say. And this young man likes to use the English Standard Version. 
Now, I've never used that one, but I, people that do really enjoy it and, and, and appreciate uh, its accuracy to the degree that it is. <coughs> he preached from the English Standard Version, and as he met with the elders, um, no, he, he received a telephone call from the eldership of the congregation. Do you always preach from the English Standard Version? Yes, sir, I do. That'll be fine, and we'll not have any more conversation. He did not get a job because of the translation of the Bible that he used. Yeah, isn't that sad? That's sad. But so it still exists. It does still exist. And I think that it probably always will till Jesus comes because we're a people that are going to constantly be challenged by culture and even by our own concepts as we strive to grow and and be centrist in our posture. Um, thank you for that question. So here we are with a particular book that deals, that's from the best friend of Jesus, probably to a congregation of the Lord's church and those that she's converted, thus new converts. And it gives emphasis to a body of, of, of a message uh, called the truth, revelation of God that entails law commandments to be obeyed and emphasizes the specific teaching about Jesus Christ a doctrine and it's teaching us not to fellowship with those who do not abide in this teaching so there's the introductory material let's let's outline the book of second John Great. We'll outline the book and then we'll be able to have a break and come back. We'll read the, 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 the book, watch it unfold, and then we will make application of its emphasis to our lives. The outline of the book is simple. We look at the introduction. That would be verses 1 uh, to 3. I find this of interest as we look at these introductory words. We've read verses 1 and 2 uh, more in depth. Look at verse 3. He says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Of interest to me, this is very similar to the greeting the Holy Spirit used through Paul but it differs greatly. Very similar, but extremely different in, the, in this light. The preposition that is used. Frequently, Paul would write and he would say, grace and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ. And the preposition that he would use would be the preposition apo. Grace and peace to you away from God and away from His Son. In other words, from the very throne room of God all the way from them to your heart and life. Grace and peace. That was Paul's writing. But in John, in 2 John, the preposition that is used is para. Well, why? Para means alongside. Let's see, parable, parabole, bole, balo, throw, paro, alongside. This is a book emphasizing fellowship. This is a book talking about being right there alongside of God in your life and God alongside you in your life. And thus the very prepositions that are used. In the introduction emphasizes that. That's amazing to me. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you alongside of God and alongside of the Lord Jesus. In other words, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you as you are in fellowship with God and as you are in fellowship with His Son. And remember what he wrote back over in 1 John chapter 1? When he said, verse 3, 
That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. So now He's saying, grace, mercy, and peace be with you as you are alongside of God and He you, as you are alongside His Son and He you. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you as you know the fellowship of God. That's beautiful. That's the introduction. As the chapter fleshes out, you have two major points. There are words of commendation in verses 4 through 6 where he's commending this sister or this congregation, as we think, for their faithfulness. And then there are words of caution in verses 7 through through 11, where he cautions this sister or this congregation not to extend the fellowship they have with God to certain individuals. Words of commendation, words of caution, and then finally, you have the conclusion in verses 12 and 13, where he would like to keep writing, but he says, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to reserve some things until we see each other face to face. And thus the, the outline of the book. Let's take a break and when we come back we will read these 13 verses. Basically we'll pick up with verse 4 and go through verse 11 and look at the words of commendation, the words of caution, and then we will step away from the book itself and apply its teachings on fellowship to our lives. Okay? Let's break.